Life is difficult. That's what my mother said when I was 12 years old, struggling to stand up to bullies. It's difficult, son, and you need to defend yourself. I remember those words coming out of our mouth before walking out of the front door to play football. You see, I've been hiding from this kid, Flint, and Flint did everything in his power to terrorize me. If I was swinging on a swing, he would go out of his way to kick me off of it. When I was riding on a bike, he would throw rocks at me. Flint terrorized me. But that day, Flint and I fought, and I didn't win by any means. But I hurt him bad enough for him to find another target and leave me the hell alone. The events of that day flashed through my mind as I dreamt, only to wake up and realize I was still in a terrible situation, clinging to a life raft stuck in the Indian Ocean far away from my country, far away from my team, just me, alone, floating there. In the back of my mind, I knew they would search for me. We didn't leave our brothers behind. And that's what I kept telling myself. They're looking for you. And it was that little ray of hope, plus my learned instinct to fight, facing kids like Flint, that I believe are the reason why I'm alive to this day. Listen to me, as a member of Special Operations Teams, we do missions, missions that few people know about. We die in places that most Americans have never heard of. It's okay, that's what I signed up for. And I knew what I was getting into. One of the things that stands out to me the most about being stranded on the ocean was the constant rain. Not thunderstorms, not high waves, but just this torrential rain for hours. Also, I remember when it first showed up. By it, I mean this island. At first, I thought I was hallucinating. Drifting at sea for five days will do things to your mind. It starts to play tricks on you. But then as I got closer and closer, I could smell the vegetation. Distinctly different from the smell of the salt water. It had to be real. With all the energy I could muster, I used my hands and paddled and paddled and paddled until I got there. And by there, I mean a hundred yards away from the island. Current pulling my raft just off the beach, circling that island. Decision time, I told myself. Get off and try and bring the raft in with you or just swim for it. I tried to swim, dragging that raft behind me, but made absolutely no progress. The current just kept pulling me around. So I grabbed the weapon I had, which had been soaking in water for five days, my handgun, and swim for that island as hard as I could. Only, and I mean only to be met by these jagged rocks that I needed to climb to get out of the water. As I climbed those rocks, my mother's words replayed in my head. Life is difficult, son, along with those of my team instructor. Parker, there will be times that you find yourself in situations that only two things will save you. God Almighty himself and sheer fucking will, son. I can't tell you when God is going to step in to save your life, but I can tell you what. You can summon sheer fucking willpower. Climbing those sharp rocks after being soaked and drenched in water for five days, that was sheer fucking will. And me happening upon this island, I figured that was God Almighty putting his powers to work himself. But what I discovered there had absolutely nothing to do with God and more to do with Satan himself. Understand, as I came up over those rocks, my feet touched solid ground, the island immediately gave me the creeps, dense woods, vines that ran across the floor of the forest. Exhausted, I remember falling to my knees and praying. Then waking up hours later, it's dark, to the sound of voices in the distance, more accurately, screaming in the distance. Kneeling in the darkness, I turned myself in the direction of the sound and I could see it, they're off in the woods, lights, not flashlights, but torches moving, dancing around, bobbing up and down. My instinct was to scream, help, help. And something deep down inside of me, call it God's intervention, said, be quiet and go scout it out first. Stomach growling, you slowly walk into the wood line, each step placed carefully, not to make a sound. And that's when I first got a glimpse of them. A man running through the woods with just a torch in hand, skinny, tall, brown skin. He was wearing a crown on his head made of human jawbones and teeth. The guy runs right past me so close that I can smell the stench of death reaping from the pores of his skin. And it was right there in that moment that I realized I might have been better off floating in the ocean than ever setting foot on this damn island. You hear the screams again, slowly moving in that direction. I see torches, 20 of them, all of them gathered in one spot. From 70 yards away in the woods, I can't make out what's going on, so I move in closer, crawling along the ground, 
sliding over vines 30 yards away, 25 yards away. You can go no further. And I don't want to because what I witnessed before my eyes had to be a scene from hell itself. A man and a woman tied to a tree, her breast cut off and roasted over an open fire. The man, chunks of flesh removed from his arms and thighs, blood everywhere, human bones piled up on the ground. These were cannibals. And I remember laying there thinking to myself, with all the possibilities of things that could have gone wrong for me in my life, at this point in time, I end up here on an island full of cannibals. It didn't make any sense to me in that moment at all. And I distinctly remember the process that my mind went through, the victimization, saying, man, it could have been wild animals, tigers, lions. Hell, it could have been an island full of lesbians. But no, no, I get stranded at sea and land on a fucking cannibal island. Like I told you, my mind starts to spiral. What the hell, God, really? As I lay there, rats begin to emerge from the woods, crawling over my arms, legs, and hands. One moving right in front of my face. When I'm trying to lay as still as possible, rats nibbling on my body, the screaming stops as their throats are slit, blood is collected in a skull and passed around the drink. When that skull was passing around through the group, that's when I first noticed him. By him, I meant a white man standing there in jeans and a button down shirt amongst the cannibals. 30 minutes later, they all leave and the rats come flooding and feasting on the human flesh, bathing in blood. And when I finally mustered the courage to move in for a closer look, I began to realize something. See, the cannibals themselves, they looked indigenous. But these people, these poor people looked American. Quietly, I wade through the hungry rats, kicking them away from my feet just to get close enough to the man. He's wearing blue jeans, a polo shirt. Checking his pockets, I find one American dollar. Motherfucker, how? How does an American end up on an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, being eaten by cannibals. That night, standing there right next to this man's dead body, I gave myself a new mission. I was getting off this damn island. And as for these cannibals, oh, I was going to send as many of them as I could straight to hell. But first, I needed to eat and find a place to sleep. So I took my knife and killed two of those rats, headed back to the place where I first climbed over the rocks. Just on the edge of the wood line, I dug a hole so I can build a fire and conceal it. Then snuck back and stole some of those hot embers from the fire and cooked those rats for some nourishment. For the rest of the night, I moved across the outskirts of that island seeking shelter. And that's when I came across even more terrifying discoveries. In one section of the island, I found children's toys, books and clothes, little girls panties and shoes. What was strange was that the children's books weren't American. They were Japanese. Listen to me when I tell you, I didn't fully understand what was going on. I didn't have all of the pieces of the puzzle, but the pieces that I did find were pissing me off. But now on top of everything that I witnessed, everything that I've seen, discovering that someone had been clearly bringing children to this island, it starts to rain. I'm talking about that hard, stinging rain, the same rain that I felt while floating at sea on that raft all night. Everything in me told me, seek shelter find a place to get dry. But I decided to keep moving, thinking to myself, if these people only managed to operate by fire and torches, it lessened the chance of them seeing me at night as I moved around through the rain. Around sunrise, the rain began to stop and I heard the sound of a plane taking off, moving in that direction. That's when I first saw the people fenced in and locked in cages. 15 people, two men, 10 women and three children all sitting in cages, soaking wet. They looked worn. Their bodies looked worn down and tired like they had been there for weeks. Listen to me, in a situation like that, your humanity cries out to you, telling you to help them, but helping them only would lead to me being captured, as I didn't know exactly what I was dealing with. So I backtracked, placing a mark on the outskirts of the island, so I would know how to get back to that spot. I told myself, keep moving, keep moving. We need to know how many cannibals are actually here on this island. By the time the sun was at its apex, I will find out.
by the time the sun was at its peak, I would find out. Because that rocky terrain on the outskirts of the island starts to level off, leading down to a sandy beach. There on the beach were the cannibals, only men. The younger ones, slender and muscular. The elders lay in the sun, shaking violently, bodies convulsing. They submerged themselves into the ocean, surf turning red from the blood washing off their bodies. I counted three older men, ten young men, ages between 13 and 35. Their appearances varied though. Some were more Asian looking, with dark skin, others African looking, a true mixture of races. That day I watched them tracking and back into the woods to their home, a village with makeshift huts, and observed their weapons, crude bows and arrows, slingshots, atlaws, axes made of stones, and it was there while observing them in their village that I saw these men having sex with the corpse of the dead woman they had recently killed. Dealing with them would be easy. Killing them would be a pleasure. But the plane? The plane? That was the one problem I had to solve. How in the hell was I going to get off of this island? And luckily enough for me, I wouldn't have to wait much longer to solve that mystery. Because that night, I found the landing strip. Just the clearing on the island. Parked there was an old jeep covered in a plastic tarp. Someone, someone with money had flown this jeep there and left it on this island. And it was right there in that moment that I knew that that same someone was my ticket off of this island. Standing there right next to that jeep covered in that plastic tarp, I made a decision. I decided I was going to murder them all, every last one of them. But first, I needed some rest. And on my way back to the location where I first landed on the island, I stumbled across this small cave. Wouldn't even call it a cave, more of an overhang. Just enough space for me to sit down and hide. My weapon, which had been wet for days, I had no way of knowing if it was still shoot. But I did have my knife, and that would have to do. So I lay there under that damp overhang and prayed to God, saying, Father, I know you sent me here for a reason, and if it's your will that I destroy the evil on this island, let it be done. But I need to eat, and I need rest. Just a little rest and food, I promise you I'll do what you ask. Just help me out this one time. Next thing you know, I remember waking up, looking around, finding myself surrounded by crabs, six or seven crabs, just laying there, food to eat. Thank you, Lord, for this small favor. Later that night, it rained, so I took leaves and made a rain catch, drinking water and resting again, determined to make it off of this island. On the second day when I awoke, food in my belly, body hydrated, I made my way back to the beach and waited. And just like I thought, they all showed up on the beach to bathe themselves in the water. So I circled my way back to the camp for a closer look. Moving in between two huts, I hear this woman's voice at a low tone saying, Hey, you, help me. Help me, please. Looking inside, there's this woman. She's naked, tied to a makeshift bed. Tears rolling down her face as she says, Please, help me. Please. They've had me here for weeks. Please, help me. Shh, be quiet. Please, help me. She begs, voice getting louder and louder. Again, I say, shh. Please be quiet. I will help you, but I need you to calm down. Listen to me when I tell you I'll never forget the look in this woman's eyes. A mixture of hope, fear. Answer this question for me. How many of these cannibals are on this island? And it was during this conversation that I confirmed that I had seen every last one of them. Also, I learned that her name was Mary and that Mary was from Cleveland. She was out with some of her friends having drinks, took a taxi, and woke up on the plane and eventually landed here. The more Mary talked, the more the decibels of her voice increased. So I'm trying to calm her down, saying, listen, Mary, I can get us off this island, but I need you to trust me. I need you to be quiet. If they come back now, I can't deal with them all. I explained to her that I'm active U.S. military and that somehow, by the grace of God, I lucked up and washed up on this island and I could help her. As I'm trying to explain this, As those words are coming out of my mouth, she cuts me off by saying, they raped me. They raped me over and over and over again. Please, please help me. Trying to keep Mary focused, I tell her, listen, the other night there were these white men here on the island. Are they still here? And that's when Mary confirmed that it was a middle-aged white man that brought her to this island. As she's talking about him, this look of panic comes over her face. She goes on to say that it was her along with another woman but they killed that woman and kept her alive again i say to her mary stay calm listen to me mary stay calm do any of these men have guns her reply no 
Can you stay alive for a few more days, Mary? Listen to me, Mary. I need you to do whatever it takes to stay alive for a few more days. We're going to get out of here. But whatever they want you to do, Mary, just do it. I need you to stay alive. And one more question, Mary. Do you know when the plane comes? When does the plane come? She goes on to tell me that the plane lands four times a month. However, she couldn't tell me exactly what was going on because she was being held captive here in this hut. All she heard was the plane landing and taking off. Now imagine the scene, us holding hands, me slowly backing away from her, saying, Mary, stay alive. Don't give up. God is with us. By tonight, it'll start. I just need you to stay alive and be strong. Tears ran down her face as she realized I wasn't about to release her. I couldn't. I couldn't risk them coming back to their village and finding her missing. But what I could do and what I did well was kill. So that night I set out to do just that, sneaking back into their village in the dead of night. There she was, Mary sleep, bleeding from her female parts, laying on her stomach. Next to her was one of the younger men, no more than 20, 22 years old, big, tall, muscular. And as for him, his life was taken quickly and quietly. Never knew what hit him. Severed his spinal cord. My motion wakes Mary. Shh. Bloody finger over her lips. The next seven were dispatched quietly and neatly. I was hoping to take out the other two without a fight. But that wouldn't happen. Because the next little hut I entered, he was awake. On his knees, praying or meditating. When his eyes opened, you should have seen the look of shock on his face. Then he lets out a scream in an unknown language before my knife plunges into his throat. Out come the other three with weapons in hand, so I move back into the woods. They come to his hut finding him, bleeding out, then separating, moving to other huts, seeing the rest of them dead. A sense of panic and confusion smothers them. But then I watched as all three of them moved in the direction of the hut where Mary was, realizing they would blame her. I had no choice but to circle them, darting out of the woods. I was able to catch one of them from behind, thrusting my knife into his stomach from behind, pulling it all the way around, ripping open his bowels. These bitches wanted blood, and I was going to give them blood. Twisting and ripping that knife out, I jabbed it into the side of his neck, throwing his body forward onto the ground. There's this awkward moment of silence when the other two of them process what just happened, me standing there completely covered in blood. Then, this explosion of anger as both of them charged in my direction one with a stone axe the other armed with only his bare hands as he's raising the axe into the air over his head my blade plunges upward into the bottom of his chin through his tongue into his mouth pulling it out his body falls limp to the ground now standing there covered in blood and mud final cannibal sets his eyes on me and realizes that he stood no chance so he turns and runs but no, 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 no. You don't get to escape. None of these people did. So you don't get to fucking escape. You don't get to fucking run away. Anger inside of me served as fuel, allowing me to run him down in the middle of the night, dodging trees, jumping over logs, tackling him. I was bloodthirsty. I knew it. And I gave into it because it was the right thing to do. If you've never taken a man's life, you will not understand what I'm about to explain to you. But I know what it's like to feel that man struggling, fighting for his life, his breath blowing into your face and to punch him over and over and over again until you break his will. There's something funny about taking a man's life because you can feel the moment when he realizes, the moment when his will is broken, the moment when he understands that he's about to be murdered at your hands. And I remember that moment with this man. I remember seeing his eyes wide open, bright as daylight, even though we were in the midst of the dark jungle. He knew that I was about to murder him like he had done to so many others. And I felt it when he gave up. His eyes told the whole story. Now, the only ones left were the old men, feeble, shaking, suffering. When I returned to free Mary, she looked at me with fear in her eyes, almost as if she couldn't believe that I was saving her. I told you I would come back for you, didn't I? Only their elders are left. But I'm tired, I said, as I cut her loose and handed her the knife. Naked, she rose from the bed with vengeance. And for the next 10 minutes, I listened to her scream 
as she murdered those old men. The sounds of steel and flesh meeting, crackling, twisting, grinding against bones. That night we managed to take care of the threat but we still needed to find a way to get off the island. So we went to the cages and freed everyone there and learned that they all had been there for weeks only given water and offered meat to eat. One of the men, a man named Joshua, said he was last in a hotel in Dallas with a prostitute, was drugged and woke up in a cage on a plane. Understand, these people were shaking. They had no clue where the hell they were. And to see the two of us covered in blood, Mary's body completely naked, only made it worse. So Mary told them about what she endured, the cannibalism, what was waiting for them had we not come to save them. And they still didn't trust us. The entire time she's trying to win them over, I'm trying to figure out when this plane will come back. But because of the shock, they weren't giving up anything and the kids, my God, those children were terrified. That night I took them to the beach and I told them that in the morning they could go see for themselves. Back at the beach, this time I submerged my body into the ocean, cleaning the blood, washing it from my flesh and clothes. I cut off one of my pants legs and gave Mary my shirt. It was all I could offer to her so she could cover herself up. Laying there on the beach, she cuddled up right next to me, thanking me for saving her. And that night I slept better than I had ever slept in my life. No bad dreams, no nothing, just resting in peace. The following morning, they followed us back through the woods to the village and were greeted with the smell of dry blood, intestines spilled on the ground. The children covered their eyes in fear and I explained to them all how I came to be on this island. What I did for a living, how important it would be for them to go back into those cages so we could leave this island. I'm not going back in that fucking cage. Eric, one of the other men, screams, I'm not going back in that fucking cage. You see, Eric was a nightclub manager from New York. Same story. Met a girl at his club, went back to her hotel, and woke up in a cage. Mary, who had already persuaded them once, started in on them again. She explained to them, that she had experienced the worst of this godforsaken island and how I had single-handedly did everything they saw before their eyes and that our best chance of getting off this island was listening to me. So that morning I learned that when that plane landed sometimes there were two or three men and there was always a pilot who never left the plane. When I inquired about the men being armed with guns they said no. The only thing they bring with them are their evil arrogant words. They taunted us and terrorized us while we were in those cages, pointing at the children, saying, you're going to die next. Understand, by noon that day, we decided on our plan to get off of this island. Everyone agreed that when the time was right, they would remain in the cages, doors unlocked with sharpened sticks, and we would take leaves and branches from the trees and build a blind near the cages. And when the people landed that plane on the island, simultaneously they would emerge from those cages attacking and I will be there, just steps away, to finish them off. What kind of men are they, I asked. Do they strike you as men who are able to kill? Mary chimes in saying, no, they're freaks. They like watching people die, but they won't do it themselves. So over the next few days, I trained them all on the swiftest and fastest ways to kill a man. We sharpened sticks, took hand-sized rocks. The kids were given even smaller rocks to throw at them for a diversion. We drilled it over and over and over and over again for five sunrises. Then all we had left to do was wait. And wait we did for another two weeks, eating crabs, drinking rainwater. Then one morning, something, my instincts, or maybe it was God himself, but I could feel them coming. I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything, but I felt it. Trusting those instincts, I told them today, we're going to run our practice drills again and again and again and again. We had done it 10 times. I'm standing there thinking my mind is playing tricks on me. But then I hear the plane is circling the island to land. Everyone darts into their places. Mary and I hide just 30 feet away in the blind. Eric and Josh are back inside of their cages. The kids laying on the ground with rocks hidden beneath their bodies. As the plane lands, I say, this is it. Kill or be killed. Remember. The pilot cannot see us. We must kill or be killed. All we have to do is take care of whoever comes off this plane. No matter who they are, no matter what they look like, no matter what they say, they must die. Do you understand? Five minutes later, you hear the sound of the jeep starting. 
then the squeak of the suspension driving along. When they pull up, it's two men and a woman. And just as they said, these men were evil. Climbing out of the jeep, one of them walks over to the caged children and begins to urinate on them. While he's doing that, the woman begins to laugh. And I can see the anger boiling up in Mary's face. But we needed to wait. Wait until they got closer to Eric and Josh. In that moment, Mary touches my hand and whispers, I'll deal with her. They strolled slowly and casually in front of the cages, saying, which one of you are we going to eat this weekend? And when they came to Josh's cage, the three of them standing there, staring at him, taunting him, I think it should be you. And that's when the kids sprung the trap, throwing rocks at them. Those rocks caused one of them to take off in their direction. Eric rises up to his feet, kicks the cage door open, and then the reality of the situation quickly sinks in to these people as they freeze. One of the men turns to run only to be greeted by Josh stabbing him in the neck with a sharpened stick, blood squirting out of his neck with each and every heartbeat. Mary darts from the blind, tackling the woman, her head smashing against the metal cage and bludgeons her to death with sharp rocks. The other man turns to run back to the jeep but doesn't get far because he's struck in the head by one of the other women. They tackle him and beat him mercilessly. These people had done as I asked. Dispatched of them quickly before I could ever get involved. The only thing left to do was get to the plane. So we circled through the woods back to the plane. The door still down. The pilot sleep. I board quietly. He's awakened to my knife in his ear. Don't panic, buddy. You're safe. All we need you to do is fly this plane back to where you came from. Now, patting his body down, I say, do you know what happens here on this island? His reply is no, but judging on the fact that you have a knife in my ear, I know whatever it is can't be good. A quick conversation takes place between the two of us. Are they dead? Yes. Why? Because they were cannibals. His head turns, our eyes lock, and he says, listen, I am not involved in this. I was paid $15,000 to fly here and fly back. They told me that it was an exclusive resort where they had some kind of meeting. Now, the look on this man's face was genuine confusion. As he says, those people couldn't have been, they couldn't have been cannibals. And as the word cannibal is coming out of his mouth, the others begin to board the plane covered in blood. Looking over his shoulder, he says, who are these people? These are the lives you're going to save today. These are the people's lives you're going to save today by flying us out of here. Trust me, we don't want to risk flying this plane on our own. But if we have to, we will die trying to get off of this island. Those words give him enough motivation to get the plane moving. And an hour and a half later, we land in Diego Garcia. And that's when the realization really sinks in. The people on that island had been smuggled right under the nose of the U.S. and British military. It angered me, sent me to levels of rage that I never knew was even possible. Then being treated like a criminal by my own government made it even worse. Listen to me, in my debriefing, I told them word for word everything that happened. And I was warned not to share these events. To be more specific, to keep my fucking mouth shut. However, I'm old now. I can see death coming. He's been at my doorstep waiting for a while now. I'll be going soon. And I want my story told. And if there's one thing I want before I go out, I want my story told. I believe it's a story about the wrath of God, judgment, good versus evil. And it's important that people understand that no matter what you do, no matter how you treat people, the day comes where we're all going to have to pay our fare. Listen to me, those people who were saved from that island were sent back home, paid money, and signed non-disclosure agreements, not to say a fucking word. So I speak for them when I say this. Together, we cut down evil, real evil, evil that people haven't seen since the biblical days. And God chose me, me to strike the first blow.